Okay, hi all. This is our uh, case study for module five. And we're gonna be talking about uprisings of enslaved people, as well as in particular, the 1811 uprising, uh, which happened not so far from here in Louisiana. So this pairs with our module on reform. We're gonna see some connections to abolition and anti-slavery. We're also gonna see ways in which um, the strategies that we talked about in abolition and anti-slavery and temperance and so on were not the only ways people sought to make change. Uh, the direct action uh, and violent approaches were also seen as very necessary by many. So throughout the history of the area that becomes the United States, or at least the history uh, from 1619 on, uh, when people of African descent are held in unfree labor, uh, turning into eventually racial chattel slavery. Uh, enslaved people rose up against enslavers and against the institution of slavery. And more or less anywhere in what is today the United States, where slavery played a large role, we can find uprisings of enslaved people. Um, this here you can see is a historical marker. Um, it's from the state of South Carolina, not so far from Charleston, South Carolina, uh, which you may remember we talked about uh, in our module when we talked about the Carolina Company. Um, this is um, a memorial to something known as the Stono Rebellion of 1739, uh, where dozens, perhaps hundreds, of enslaved people um, rose up violently um, and sought to gain freedom. Um, it says here, um, they killed at least uh, 20 white people. Um, and eventually a white militia, a white military unit in South Carolina uh, battled uh, and defeated them. This, um, like many other uprisings, um, led to the white population uh, and those in power imposing much harsher conditions on enslaved people. And there are a number of uprisings in Louisiana here uh, in, 17, in the 1780s, uh, an uprising of, led by someone named Saint Malo um, in sort of Bas du Fleuve, which is near the Jean Lafitte Preserve near New Orleans. Uh, near New Roads, um, there was another conspiracy uprising, the Mina Conspiracy. In 1795, near Point Coupe, there was another uprising. Uh, and in 1811, the, the uprising of 1811, sometimes called Charles de Lons Rebellion, after the leader of it, uh, was the largest uprising of enslaved people in the history of the United States. And we'll talk about that some more. And right here in Lafayette, which was called Vermilionville at the time, uh, and near Opelousas, in St. Martinsville, St. Martinville, sorry, uh, there was perhaps an uprising. Uh, and I'll talk about that at kind of the end of our little case study here um, and talk about what I mean by we're unsure there. So I'm gonna focus here on the 1811 uprising. The 1811 uprising, um, this graphic says slave revolt. You'll remember in our course, we're gonna use the term enslaved people instead of slave. Um, began near Woodland Plantation in January of 1811. So it's supposed to happen kind of during uh, festival season and this lead up towards Mardi Gras uh, because of um, where the white population would be at that time, often clustered in New Orleans. Um, over 200, as you can see here, enslaved people uh, begin moving towards New Orleans. Um, they march on New Orleans with the idea to seize New Orleans and potentially change the history of the region. Unfortunately, um, one of the enslavers that they encounter manages to escape across the river uh, and make his own way down towards New Orleans, um, beating the insurgents there. 
uh, and allowing um, military troops time to gather and march out to confront the insurgents here on the way, not, not so far from the New Orleans airport, uh, where, where it is today. Um, this large contingent of military forces uh, defeated the insurgents in open battle, uh, forcing them uh, to retreat, uh, many of whom were captured or killed. Had um, the enslaver, a guy by the last name of Andrew, not escaped across the river and made it to New Orleans ahead of the insurgents, it's very possible that they would have succeeded in taking and burning New Orleans. And, and it's possible that would have significantly changed the history of the United States. And it's often something that is forgotten or actively left out of history, right? And so re in recent years, the past few years, a number of people have sought uh, to bring attention to this 1811 uprising. Historians like Albert Thrasher, who worked on this book on to New Orleans with a, another person, um, produced this, this on to New Orleans book, which is mostly made up of primary sources, original documents, um, documenting kind of the history uh, leading up to this moment and of this moment and of the aftermath, in addition um, to in addition to um, including uh, an, somewhat of a narrative uh, history as well. Around the same, or sorry, later than after that, a few years ago, a guy named Daniel Rasmussen, who'd conducted research as an undergraduate student published a book called American Uprising, The Untold History of America's Largest Slave Revolt, and it became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, if you're interested in hearing or reading more and learning more about this history, I would certainly encourage you to look to the On to New Orleans book to the left of your screen, which is rooted in historical documents and decades of research. Uh, Whereas the American Uprising book, despite making a New York Times bestseller list, is not a great book. Um, it, it doesn't give you a particularly um, accurate um, picture of what happened. Uh, and if you are interested in learning more, in addition to the On to New Orleans book, one of the people who contributed to the book uh, runs a company called Hidden History in New Orleans that can give uh, tours based on a lot of research uh, related to this. Perhaps the highest profile thing that's drawn attention to um, this uprising is something that was called the Slave Rebellion Reenactment produced by um, a well-known artist named Dred Scott here. Uh, and here he is pictured um, in an issue of Vanity Fair. Uh, Dred Scott, along with the filmmaker John Acomfra and some other uh, organizers, many other organizers, uh, created a reenactment of the rebellion, but imagining a different outcome for it. Uh, imagining it had succeeded in its aims of going to New Orleans. So their rebellion reenactment does not include um, the defeat at the hands of, 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 of these US troops, but instead ends uh, with a celebration in Congo Square at New Orleans, having reached uh, their intended aim. And one of the things for you to look at this week is, uh, or this module, is a video posted on Moodle. It's very short, like six or seven minutes, uh, produced by Dred Scott and his collaborators um, about the, the slave rebellion reenactment. Um, and here's a short video I shot at the reenactment that gives you kind of a sense of what it looked like. This is at the very start by Woodland Plantation where it began. And so as um, the insurgents in 1811 um, and as the reenactors in 20, 2019 um, did, 
they would march from Woodland towards New Orleans. And as they did, additional people would join from an 1811 plantations and in the present places where those plantations were. And so this is a much smaller group than it would be by the end where it was hundreds strong. But it'll give you kind of a sense of uh, what it looked like um, kind of in the spaces of Louisiana in 2019. And the person in the front is Dred Scott. So and I encourage you to learn more about that. I think it helps us understand to an extent the history, but also why the history might matter. And I think in the video, it kind of talks about why this event from 1811 is still relevant in, well, in 2019 when they made it, and obviously continues to be so. So in addition to the uprising of 1811, I wanna just briefly mention a couple of the other kind of big moments. Uh, in um, armed resistance to slavery. Um, I'm gonna go through them relatively quickly and kind of, you, if you're interested in learning more, let me know and I can provide you with lots of kind of um, places to read more and learn more about them. So in South Carolina in Charleston in 1822, this man, Denmark Vesey, um, this is a later rendering of him, uh, not one based on him sitting there, uh, in 1822, a man named Denmark Vesey was arrested and along with 35, 34 other people hanged in what was at the time the largest public execution in U.S. history. He was accused of masterminding a massive planned uprising of enslaved people in the Charleston area where they would kill large numbers of white people, seize ships, at least one, and sail to freedom in Haiti. Historians have since debated over whether Vesey had actually planned this or whether the conspiracy uh, was made up by whites looking to target the black population. The majority of historians believe that Vesey had in fact planned um, this uprising. Um, and there's plenty of uh, places again for you to learn more about this. Um, it's useful for us to remember, too, that white people in South Carolina were so terrified of the specter of an uprising of enslaved people, like the one likely led by Vesey, that in order to send a message to the enslaved population, they didn't execute Vesey and his co-conspirators one by one, but rather they, at significant expense, constructed a giant gallows so that they could hang, essentially lynch, 35 people at the same time to send that message. As I've mentioned briefly in the video uh, for a lecture for the case study, in 1831, a man named Nat Turner um, led an uprising of enslaved people in Southampton County in Virginia, near Richmond. Uh, and this was perhaps the most infamous, best known, most celebrated by some uprising um, of enslaved people in U.S. history because the 1811 uprising, though significantly larger, um, was suppressed heavily in newspapers because the white population of Louisiana didn't want people to know about it. Uh, they were worried that this would spread revolutionary ideas among the enslaved population. Although, of course, most of the enslaved population knew about it. In both 1822 and 1831 in South Carolina and Virginia, with Vesey and Turner, uh, the states imposed harsher laws on enslaved people after these uprisings. And finally, the last thing I'll mention before you go off uh, from this case study video to watch the short video on the slave rebellion reenactment is that there may very well have been an uprising planned right here in Lafayette in 1840. 
uh, more research needs to be done on it. Um, all I know, um, and from the people I've been able to talk to, all most people seem to know, is that there was an article published in the New Orleans Picayune on September 5th, 1840. I'm not gonna read it because of the racial language it uses from the time, uh, but this article here, and this is um, obviously not the original article, it's a transcript of it. Um, the Times Picayune, the New Orleans paper, learned of it from a Vermilion paper, uh, the Vermilion Gladiator, which I don't believe these issues of the Vermilion Gladiator still exist, it was a local paper. And the story that this article spins is that there was a, a potentially widespread planned uprising of enslaved people, um, but enslavers were informed of it. Um, and that the plan had been to march into Lafayette, called Vermilionville at the time, to take it and then move to St. Martinville, and then Opelousas, uh, and that it involved cannon, a cannon, artillery, it gives a specific location, Valerie Martin's plantation. Um, but more research needs to be done uh, before we know what happened. It's difficult to rely on kind of biased white sources like this, but there does seem to be some indication uh, that something was going on in Lafayette in 1840. So I'll keep this short. I'll stop it there. And uh, you can go and watch the uh, video from the Slave Rebellion reenactment and complete your video quiz based on this. As always, please let me know uh, if you have any questions.